Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Vishal Gachar. Uh, I'm a postdoc with the Breakthrough Listen team. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, all of our observation facilities, uh, various different projects that's been going on. And we are currently trying to undertake uh, these newer projects with some of the other observation facilities. Um, this is just like a brief summary um, of all of these uh, observation plans. Uh, I may not get a chance to go much uh, into the details, but uh, my email is mentioned here so feel free to write to me if you have question about any other thing that I'm uh, talking about today um, okay so breakthrough listen program is uh, humanity's best effort uh, so far in order to uh, search for signs of what we call techno signature which is in a way uh, trying to find evidence of intelligent life in the universe uh, there are various different ways when one can go about doing that um, for example, uh, over the years, people have figured out like transmission over radio frequencies are extremely powerful and they can travel across large distances in our galaxy. So uh, we hypothesize that, that radio waves are our, our best way to sort of communicate over large distances. Um, now there are various different types of radio signals that one could search for. Uh, most likely the one that are the most powerful one are the signals that we we deliberately transmit uh, for example uh, the planetary radar signal uh, which are in fact detectable all the way across the galaxy they are so powerful uh, there are also other uh, low power transmitters uh, which we don't really uh, transmit uh, to uh, which don't really aim to be transmitted for larger distances it's only for local transmission but these radio waves also do travel in space and uh, they in a way uh, get leaked so this is what we call the leakage variation so there are these two different types of radio signals that one can actually uh, search for one is the deliberate uh, transmission from a powerful antenna or second it's like a leakage kind of radiation uh, we hope that uh, with using our uh, listen facilities that we are currently trying to engage we are capable of detecting both of these type of radiation from our nearby from our solar neighborhood there is also um, various hypotheses which people have suggested that maybe lasers uh, high power lasers are one of the ways in which you could uh, communicate over large distances um, i'm not going to talk too much about the uh, the optical uh, seti i'm mainly going to focus on the uh, radio seti uh, in this talk so uh, one of the main goal of the breakthrough listen program is to search all of our most of our nearby stars um, there are uh, currently a list of 1 million stars that we would like to uh, target uh, as our uh, primary list of targets. Um, then we also want to survey the galactic plane as well as the galactic center. Uh, this is just more like a blind survey. And there are some telescopes which are more uh, suitable for surveying these kind of uh, regions. We would also like to survey all of our nearby galaxies. Uh, there are, uh, we have a plan to currently search for some of around 100 nearby galaxies to search for uh, civilizations which are far more advanced than we, try, we could hope um, in any way near to us. Uh, so in, in a way, the targets are large. Uh, the, the, what we aim to do with Breakthrough is quite huge. Um, in fact, what we, uh, and, and in order to kind of do that, uh, we actually ha uh, have deployed a very sophisticated instrument. In fact, the amount of data we collect with various different observatory is so large, like you could imagine, you could compare that that one day of a break to listen program is comparable to like a year worth of previous SETI searches. So all of these uh, amount of data and all of these things that we're trying to collect uh, is, is enormous uh, and on top of that uh, one of the other goal of the Breakthrough Listen program is to make all of our data publicly accessible uh, so there is a large so that it is used can be used by larger scientific communities. Recently uh, we have started this new collaboration with the TESS team. So TESS is uh, this satellite which was launched uh, last year um, which this has a main goal of finding transiting planets uh, around the solar neighborhood. Uh, it is it is actually going to survey something around 200 stars, uh, and it's likely going to find something around 10,000 candidates. Uh, there are some estimates that have people have uh, 
sort of uh, uh, provided before the launch, which is something around uh, 1,200 to 50 planets in our solar neighborhood itself, um, and out of which 250 are likely to be Earth size. So, which is a great uh, uh, thing for us, and we would def we would like to follow these targets with our observational facility. There are already thousand candidate um, has been published, uh, and follow up observations are already ongoing. Uh, why are we interested in tests? One of the reason is that that most of the, for example, the radio leakage that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago actually occurs. In fact, 70% of all of the radio leakage, in fact, uh, even the planetary radar transmission, all of them occurs in the, in, uh, are actually expected to occur in the plane of the, uh, of the solar system. Uh, uh, so m we could expect, like if there are transiting planet, uh, we are more likely to be in the line of sight of those transmission if there are, in fact, radio leakages coming from those planets. So uh, that is why um, we expect uh, that if we look at planets uh, uh, in their ecliptic plane, then most likely, uh, then the chances of detecting uh, radio emission is higher. So that's why we are more uh, interested in the test targets. Um, we are already uh, in a uh, collaboration. We already started a collaboration with the test team uh, in which we are currently trying to work out uh, various different observational plans uh, of with various different observation facilities. There are, there are a few papers uh, in which we are trying to outline the uh, interesting SETI targets uh, with the test team. So all of these things um, are currently under, uh, are, are ongoing. So we announced this uh, thing in September of 2019 at the ISC conference and that got a lot of press. Uh, there are lots of number of articles that came out um, in the media uh, uh, regarding this uh, new collaboration that we have started. Um, all right, so uh, just to give you an outline of our primary observing facility, there are these three main facilities which, uh, which are have dedicated telescope time um, just for SETI. Uh, the Lick Observatory uh, at, uh, um, in California is the one which has 10% of the time uh, provided just for doing SETI. Um, uh, and Howard Isaacson is the one who is leading uh, our SETI efforts uh, with that telescope. The other telescope, which is one of the largest movable structure uh, in the world, uh, this is a 100 meter giant dish uh, located in the U.S. itself, um, in West Virginia, in East Coast, um, the Green Bank Telescope. So, the one of the main advantage of Green Bank Telescope is that it allows us um, and it provides us a continuous frequency coverage. It has various different suite of receivers, which allows a frequency coverage starting from 300 megahertz to all the way up to 100 gigahertz, um, which is really great. Uh, we have 20% of the time uh, dedicated. Uh, for doing SETI uh, on GBT as well. Uh, we have 20% of time dedicated uh, at a telescope in Southern Sky, which is a telescope called Parks Telescope located in, in Australia. Uh, Parks is slightly smaller than GBT, but it is also a powerful instrument. Um, it has a, a ongoing surveys that we have currently been operating uh, are mostly occurring at L band and S band, which are lower frequencies, but the few, uh, in future, um, Parks has in fact uh, uh, already deployed uh, an ultra wideband receiver, and we will be using the ultra wideband receiver uh, for observation with Parks. Uh, one of the main goal of Parks is to survey the galactic plane region um, uh, because it has a multi beam receiver, and multi beams are fairly good at uh, discriminating RFI. So you could blindly survey, uh, and you can do blind deep survey of the galactic plane. Uh, to search for narrow um, signals, uh, which are of interest for SETI. Uh, just to give you an outline of what's currently happening uh, at the GBT, uh, you could talk to uh, Steve more about that. He's our uh, project scientist for the Green Bank Telescope. Uh, at GBT, we have 64 compute nodes uh, and nine storage nodes, uh, which allows us to kind of store a large amount of baseband row voltage data. Uh, and then we do this, and then we, in a semi-real time, we convert all of that into what we call the filter bank format. And this is what we pass through our various different analysis chain. Uh, we have 
uh, initially made a list of something around 1100 stars that we want to um, survey. These are like the most near to near star to us. And it, this was published in uh, a paper led by Isaacson, uh, Howard Isaacson. And uh, we are currently uh, targeting these stars uh, first. Um, and if I give you an outline of what that what has already been achieved, we have completed something around uh, 83% uh, or 100% L-band and S-band and almost 83% at C-band and 60% at X-band. Um, this, the analysis of them are ongoing. Uh, we already published uh, our earlier results from L and S-band um, last year and this, this earlier this year. Uh, there are a couple of other programs that's uh, ongoing with the GBT. For example, we are also still looking at the nearby galaxies. Uh, we are also uh, trying to deploy and we're trying to commission higher frequency capabilities with the Breakthrough Listen backend. Uh, and in fact, we did an observation with the KFPA receiver, which is which spans from frequencies of 18 to 26 gigahertz. Uh, and what I'm showing you on the right hand side, this is a detection of a pulsar with the breakthrough listen backend um, across 80 to 26 of gigahertz. So which in a way uh, gives us confidence that um, our backend is, uh, uh, is able to interact with the receiver and it's able to store the data in the right format and we are able to process it. So, uh, but more such commissioning uh, experiments are ongoing for KFPA and our higher frequency bands. Uh, the other uh, telescope I give you an update uh, is the PARS telescope. If you have more questions, feel free to write to Danny Price, who is our project scientist for that. Uh, PARS has been doing um, a, a lot of survey of the galactic plane. Uh, this is uh, sort of shows you the region which Parks has already covered. So it has already completed a first pass of the entire plane. Uh, the, and it's actually doing a second pass. So all of the blue region that you see are I think the second, uh, um, are the second pass. Uh, of, or in fact, these are like the most latest uh, 48 hour uh, ago scans. Uh, we already published a paper earlier this year uh, of something around uh, 200 stars at 10 centimeter, uh, led by Danny Price. Uh, we have completed 40% uh, of, as I said, first pass com uh, is 100% completed, and the second pass is ongoing, which 40% uh, already done. Uh, there are also various different interesting targets that we follow uh, with Parks as well. Uh, in terms of a computing facility, we have uh, uh, 27 compute nodes, and we have a four storage node at that place. Um, there are more observations of uh, nearby, uh, of near a star, Proxima Centauri, where we have uh, 36 hours of uh, time being allotted uh, through tech, which is going to use the breakthrough lesson backend. Uh, we also plan to survey the galactic center region uh, using the ultra wideband receiver, which I mentioned, which goes uh, from 700 megahertz to all the way to 4 gigahertz. So a lot of exciting thing happening at Parks as well. Uh, the newest telescope, uh, which is uh, one of the, the most sensitive one, I, I would guess, uh, is the Meerkat telescope, which is an array of 64 antennas uh, in, uh, located in South Africa. Uh, if you have more questions, feel free to uh, chat with Daniel Check and Dave McMahon, who are our project lead uh, for this telescope. Uh, our plan for Meerkat is slightly different. At Meerkat, we don't have a dedicated observation, uh, dedicated telescope time. So in, we operate in a commensal observation mode um, in which we target, uh, if for example, if an observer is targeting a pulsar, uh, the primary beam of the telescope itself is so large, it's actually one square degree. You could in fact form secondary beams on other stars uh, of interesting uh, characteristics or other, or for example, if we have a list of stars that we want to follow, uh, we could do that. So that is our plan. Uh, with Meerkat that we are going to form uh, off-axis beams um, uh, on interesting targets uh, to do SETI. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was an um, intern uh, last year who, to, uh, who took a summary of all the primary uh, um, location the Meerkat will be following up. Uh, on the right are all of the different uh, Meerkat projects, um, which are currently have pro given time on the uh, on the telescope, and uh, what we have done is that we have mapped uh, a Gaia catalog stars on top of that. 
So this gives us a, a sort of an overview of that there are regions, uh, there are almost anywhere you look, there are there are stars which uh, might be of interest for SETI. Uh, so we could do a commensal SETI along with all of these observations um, when they will when they, when they will start operation. Uh, one of the low frequency facility uh, that we are currently engaging with is the telescope in Australia called MWA, uh, which, uh, and Steve Croft uh, is again leading uh, our efforts uh, at that place. So feel free to write to him if you have a question. The goal um, is to do more about to do uh, a wide field radio setting, uh, especially at lower frequencies. Um, MW is uh, quite sensitive uh, and quite uh, efficient instrument, uh, and especially located in, in, in an environment uh, at a place which uh, which has a very little uh, radio frequency interference. So it is quite uh, uh, efficient instrument. Uh, the other observing facility where we are uh, collaborating uh, very actively uh, are located in France. Um, one is Nancy radio telescope and second is the Nenufar radio telescope. Um, and for that we are uh, collaborating with Greg Helborg and Philip Sarka. Um, so NRT is actually one of the largest dish. Uh, it has a it operates at slight at lower frequencies of 1, 2, 3.5 gigahertz. Uh, there is already uh, a key, uh, so Nancy uh, is currently uh, doing some co uh, commissioning operation and I think there are some, uh, there is SETI is in accepted as one of the key science project uh, which is the, the, it's actually led by Greg Halberg uh, and in collaboration with the Göttingen University uh, and there are already uh, uh, observations plans of something around 38 nearby stars and 27 nearby galaxy. The newest telescope which is coming online where we are uh, where we are uh, actively engaging is the telescope uh, Nenufar. This is an, again uh, an extremely low frequency low radio frequency region uh, something starting from 10 to 85 megahertz. Um, the telescope uh, the backend has a capability of uh, storing uh, baseband row voltages which we eventually convert uh, to the filter bank data product for our SETI pipeline. Uh, so all of these conversations uh, and uh, engagement with uh, both of the, our collaborators are already actively um, happening. Uh, one of the telescope uh, that we are very act very uh, very they're very happy to sort of be on board uh, is the telescope in the UK, the E Merlin telescopes, which are. A 25 meter uh, telescope spread all over uh, UK uh, along with the giant Lowell telescope. Um, we uh, most of the SETI uh, telescope, uh, most of the telescope that I mentioned, which are currently engaging with SETI, are more or less single dish telescopes, are or are operate even though they are array, they will be mostly operating in like a B mode fashion uh, operation. But with E Merlin, we are trying to do a slightly different uh, type of SETI. We want to do a uh, uh, a narrowband imaging um, of the sky. So uh, this is slightly different than what we are currently trying to do with some of the other facility. And this is this can be an excellent way to discriminate uh, what is uh, what are the narrowband signal uh, that are skybound compared to what are uh, compared to terrestrial ones. Uh, so our goal is to actually use the Emerlin. Uh, correlator. So in order to do that, we have deployed a compute node, a storage node, and a head node. Uh, we in fact visited uh, the facility uh, in June this year, uh, and we took something around three hours uh, of observations towards the Kepler target. Uh, and this is a, uh, the analysis of this is currently ongoing, and it's actually being used uh, for MSC thesis by one of the student. Uh, again, our collaborator over there is uh, Michael Garrett, so feel free to uh, drop him a line if you have a question about that. Uh, I'm uh, uh, also currently trying to pursue uh, observations and SETI at two of the international facility uh, engaged with LOFAR. So LOFAR is this uh, uh, array of antennas spread all over Europe uh, with the core station located in Netherlands. Um, we are not actively uh, pursuing uh, SETI on the, all of the low fast station or on the core station, but we want to do a multi-site uh, SETI with two of the international low fast station. Uh, these are located, uh, and so we are currently in conversation and we are already have deployed um, a head node and two compute nodes are, uh, we have already purchased and currently they are being shipped to these two facilities. 
So one of them is located in Ireland Burr uh, and second is uh, located in Onsala, Sweden. Uh, both of these facilities are quite far apart from each other uh, and our goal is to do simultaneous observation of the same target uh, in order to discriminate um, any narrowband signal that we receive uh, at this facility. Uh, so these are going to be a very exciting observations. Uh, we, uh, I have a plan to observe, uh, targeting something around 12 targets. Uh, again, we would probably going to use uh, highest uh, a potential target uh, coming from the test uh, collaboration and we will going to put a dedicated time proposal uh, to do these observations. Uh, then the other high frequency telescope that we are very actively uh, engaging with is the telescope in uh, Italy called the Sardinia radio telescope which is a 64 meter single dish. Uh, the best thing about the Sardinia radio telescope is that it also has a very good frequency coverage starting from all the way to like 300 megahertz to all the way up to 26 gigahertz uh, which is quite nice for us um, uh, because one of the goal of the Breakthrough Listen program is to do is to survey the galactic center region and uh, typically when you want to do galactic center surveys at high frequencies uh, you the weather conditions can really impact the amount of time you would get on a telescope so even though uh, we would primarily like to use the gbt uh, for our survey it is likely that due to weather impacts we might not be able to conduct all of our observations uh, with that and srt can fill, fulfill that gap uh, srt can kind of help us uh, conduct these galactic center observations at high frequencies uh, so our plan is to do uh, c band and k band um, observations uh, with the SRT uh, telescope of the galactic center and we visited uh, the site again uh, earlier this year and we are currently engaging uh, in conversation with them to deploy uh, some instruments out there the other telescope that we have uh, the one of the biggest telescope in fact uh, that currently exists is the telescope located in China uh, called the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope or fast which is actually a 500 meter uh, in diameter uh, is is massive telescope it has a, a super cool uh, 19 beam receiver uh, which allows uh, a quick survey of any of galactic center uh, sorry um, galactic plane region uh, or nearby galaxies so in fact uh, we have signed an mou with them in 2016 for further collaboration to do SETI uh, with FAST. Uh, we have in fact uh, submitted a paper uh, recently uh, to do uh, for uh, discussing various different opportunities uh, or various different uh, SETI uh, experiment that we could do with FAST. Uh, and one of them I'm currently showing in this figure. Uh, one of the things you could do very well with FAST is that you could survey uh, the, our uh, nearest galaxy, the Andromeda, uh, with multiple such beams. So each of these hexagonal pattern is actually uh, consists of four pointing uh, of the 19 beam receiver. So you by using this uh, tiling technique we can very quickly survey the entire andromeda galaxy to search for uh, for uh, kardashev type 2 and type 3 civilizations so these are like civilizations which expected to uh, transmit uh, energies of the order of 10 to the power 26 or 10 to the power 36 uh, watts so these are uh, we can very easily search uh, um, several billion uh, several hundred billion stars uh, using fast telescope for uh, advanced technologies. Uh, the telescope is kind of uh, where I come from. Uh, I'm also currently trying to pursue some SETI with that. Uh, is located in India called the GMRT. GMRT uh, has also good uh, frequency coverage starting from 50 megahertz to all the way to 2 gigahertz. Uh, it is actually consists of 30 antennas spread across 25 kilometers uh, in baseline. Uh, each of these antennas are 45 meter in diameter. Uh, recently, GMRT has upgraded uh, its receiver to capture something around 400 megahertz of bandwidth, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, we are currently in conversation to put, we in fact have put a, a pilot proposal to do some uh, preliminary SETI experiment. We are also trying to search, uh, trying to get some uh, more test time uh, at GMRT uh, to get uh, some example data because our goal is to build a uh, a parallel pipeline which can do SETI 
so we are currently in conversation um, with uh, with the observatory engineers and staff in order to build uh, this pipeline. Okay, so in summary, I think uh, I kind of try to uh, give you a brief overview of all of our observational facilities. Uh, they are all spread all around the globe. Uh, they are ranging from lowest frequencies of 10 megahertz to all the way to like 100 gigahertz, for example, with the GBTEA. Um, this actually covers the entire terrestrial microwave window at various different sensitivities. Um, so this is going to be a very exciting time. Uh, and I just like to end uh, this talk by this very nice quote uh, uh, by Jill. Um, and uh, please feel free to write to me. Let me show you my email again. Uh, please do write to me if you have any question. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. So to give you an um, overview of uh, what I'm going to cover now, um, it's more kind of focused on the Allen Telescope Array, which is SETI's Institute's um, instrument, and then at the end a bit about what SETI Institute is doing with the JVLA. So rather than giving an overview of many instruments, I just want to give you um, and a bit an in-depth view of what's going on on that one instrument to actually be able to do observations and um, what kind of um, are the progress at there. So for if I guess assume not everyone knows where the Allen Telescope Array is. So it's based about five hours north by car from San Francisco in the Lassen National Forest. And if you zoom in, there's my mouse there as well. Yeah, so if you zoom in, um, that is the side overview. And at the building here with the green roof, that is the central processing room where all of the computers are based. And then you see all of those dots um, distributed here. Those are the antennas. Um, if you look into more detail of the instrument, um, the array itself has um, 42 antennas, each with um, 6.1 meter diameter. And each of those antennas um, has a feed. So if we look at the antenna itself, it's kind of an offset Gregorian system, which focuses um, the signals or what, what we receive um, here at that center, and there the antenna or the feed is located. So currently we have two versions or two generations of the feed. The picture which you see here is the second generation Antonio feed, which I go into a bit more detail later on. Um, so I spend a lot, some time on kind of a refurbishment program. But after that, so the signal is then um, detected by the feed. The feed design itself, it's a very broad band design. It covers in the second configuration, a frequency from one to um, 15, up to 15 gigahertz. At the moment usable 12 gigahertz due to the analog RF fiber link. And all of those antennas then are connected via an analog fiber to the uh, central signal processing room. So those are the yellow kind of cables which you see here. And from that point, they're kind of converted back into um, the signal on a coax cable. And we have a bunch of local oscillators, which allow us to tune and select a subband within that one to 12 gigahertz range. Uh, in particular, we have four tunings, so we can select four different frequency bands where we look at the same time with different instruments on the back end. So from the original instruments which are installed um, when the ATA has been built, we are kind of three beamformers, which have a bandwidth of 70 megahertz, and the correlator, which has uh, 64 input, inputs, so up to 32 antennas with a bandwidth of 104 megahertz. So those were kind of, so the instruments which um, were deployed when the ATA was built initially, and now we're in the process of upgrading the digital back end as well. So one of the upgrades which we have is a fast radio burst search engine, which I go into a bit more detail, but that one takes 10 antennas, which are dedicated to um, 10 kind of snap boards from the CASPO collaboration, and we do um, some processing on those. And then, so future upgrade is planned to have um, more digital signal processing back and to um, digitize the entire 42 antennas with a bandwidth of 600 megahertz. 
So on the picture here on, on the lower one, you can see here in the corner, that is um, already part of um, the new hardware which we installed, which we use to do um, on-off measurements to do array health checks. So if you look at the um, observations which are planned, so at the moment we are not actively observing, we are in the pro process of upgrading and um, the telescope so that it will be ready at the beginning of 2020 um, to start with observations. So one of the things which I already mentioned is the fast radio burst search engine, which is a collaboration with Caltech together, where we got some money from the Mount Cuba Foundation to buy compute nodes and hardware. So that one has now been installed and is hooked up to 10 antennas. And we do test observations with pulsars and basically do the commissioning of that entire system. So the first proper scientific FRB observations are planned for the beginning of 2020. The other thing um, to mention is kind of, uh, Vishal already told about that we also taking part in um, the test follow-up observations where we take the beam former with the antennas which we have available and do um, high sensitivity um, observations on certain targets. And because it's a SETI in, um, instrument as well, we also want to basically implement a SETI backend. And for that one, uh, we're working together with Breakthrough Listen because we want to replicate the hardware which they use, for example, in Meerkat um, or in other instruments and deploy that at, as, at the ATA as well so that we don't redesign our own digital backend just for um, the ATA. Um, moving on from the um, observation side, so from the history from the ATA, not much has happened the last couple of years. It was all at status quo, and now we're in the process of getting up all 42 antennas um, to do observation. And a huge um, work effort at the moment which goes into the array is assessing what works, what doesn't work. So one of those things is on the component level. So we started um, setting up test benches, which you can see down here, where we take certain equipment or analog signal equipment and test it in laboratory conditions to make sure that they actually perform and work as expected, um, rather than trying to find a problem in the entire system. Um, the other thing is as well on the front end, on the feed, so there's another picture of the feed, one of the thing, the measurements which we carry out at the moment and then is system temperature measurements. So that tells you how well your receiver works over the entire frequency bandwidth. And here, for example, we can see at a lower frequency and there's some RFI on the side. Um, and then it looks, uh, the site looks very clean up to kind of 14 gigahertz. We can basically use those feeds up to 14 gigahertz at the moment. Um, but what you can also see, some of those feeds have those periodic resonances, which indicate um, a failure on the tip design. And that is an ongoing thing in the past, which we now do a lot of work and assessment to make those feeds more reliable. But I will go into a bit more detail in the kind of feed refurbishment program um, point. And the final thing here is, um, as well as testing all the signal, components, we also need a way to make sure that when everything works, to keep track of it, that the instrument still performs as we expected. So we do that by doing um, on-off measurements on certain targets like the moon and then test um, what the um, SCFD values are. So the, um, basically the system equivalent flux density of the entire system which is one way of, if you know that all of your small um, subsystems work, it's one way of just keeping track that nothing has broken. Um, so the final kind of point I want to go in, um, which um, Vajal mentioned as well, is kind of RFI. So if our radio frequency interference, if we look for SETI objects, we look for narrowband signals as well. So we want to make sure that we understand our kind of RFI environment on the telescope. So one of those things is uh, self-generated RFI. 
So there's another picture of the kind of second generation feed here, which is at a focus point. And the picture below shows basically if you just remove that cover on the side, so you see what's inside of that feed. Um, so you can see there are control boards and kind of um, control of a cryocoolers. And all of those are emitting um, radio frequency signals as well, which are then picked up by the feed straight away. So one of the things which we need to make sure and need to understand very well is how much signals do we actually emit ourselves and is that a problem to us? Is that blinding our observation or the sensitivity of the instrument? Um, so that is um, down here kind of a, a plot from um, DC to 1 gigahertz. So that's below the frequencies which we observe generally with the instrument. But if you can imagine, if you have a very strong signal um, at those lower frequencies, it can still saturate your receiver chain um, and still blind you without you knowing it because at a frequency range where you look, it looks completely clean, but your sensitivity is gone. So you, you don't see anything anymore. So it's um, one way of kind of identifying that one as well. And um, not only identifying the RFI which we generate in our feeds itself, the other thing is local RFI on the site. So it might be that there is um, a computer or we had a case where um, a new pickup truck was bought and brought to site and that pickup truck had an OnStar emergency system on, which um, broadcast at a cell phone frequency. So there was massive RFI suddenly, um, and um, observations were impossible. So there needs to be kind of a mechanism in, in place which you can find local RFI sources. And the best way to do that is kind of to have a battery handheld system with an omnidirectional antenna and then you divide your kind of observatorium in a grid and you just walk around and make measurements at each of those positions and take the spectrum. And then you can integrate or kind of select certain bandwidths and just take the total power and make a heat map. Mm -hmm. So you, you notice basically one of those axes is even in the signal processing building, which came up more or less by coincidence. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the heat map, we see there's definitely more kind of RFI or more signal strength within the building. Just to mention, um, in our case, we don't have a shielded signal processing building like other um, observatoriums. We also um, have a microwave in there, which is something which we need to kind of work out. Um, on top of those things which are there and which you could say kind of is a static um, RFI, which um, is always there. And if you do a site assessment, um, once every half a year, you can discover new things. We have a visitor center close by. So if, sorry, if I go back, so if you see the mouse next to the building, there's a car parking lot and people drive with their cars, with their cell phones and everything right into next to this processing building, right into the middle of the array. So we also need a way of picking up if there's a cell phone on, if something has changed in the immediate um, RFI environment. And that is um, something where we now work together with um, a company called DeepSig, which spe specializes on um, RFI or kind of signal classification. So we will set up um, an omnidirectional antenna on the building, which is connected to one of their hardware. And then um, we have a live kind of dashboard, which monitors the in environment. And as soon as something pops up, like someone turns up with a car, has its cell phone on, we see that straight away that something has changed in um, the RFI environment. So there's a lot of efforts going on at the moment, basically um, sorting out the site that we have all of those informations when we go into um, the observing run at the beginning of 2020. So a bit um, on more detail on the feed refurbishment program. So the feed refurbishment program was the one where I initially came in to the project to look at. So we have um, two generation of feed. So the first generation of feed was initially kind of designed and deployed with the ATA, which you can see here in that picture. And that covers from 500 to 11 gigahertz and has a system temperature of around 80 Kelvin. Um, but with that design, there was um, some reliability issues. And in, I think, I believe it was in 2014-ish, um, 
we got additional funding funding by Franklin Antonio to redesign the feed and um, basically improve the performance and also make it more reliable. So the point which we got was um, we could improve the performance. So the frequency coverage now goes up can go up to 15 gigahertz, and at the moment with the current LNA goes up to 14 gigahertz, and we could have nearly half the system temperature. So the performance of the second generation feed increased um, significantly, but it still turned out that there, are, with that design of that log periodic feed, there is um, some reliability issues. Um, and that is the point where I now, um, or kind of where we started that feed refurbishment pro program to fix those reliability issues and make the feed more reliable. That we have it at a stage where we can roll out the second version of the feed to the entire array and have all 42 antennas going. So one of the things, so that is kind of um, the feed opened up, pointing upwards. And if you look at the tip that is from a simulation, we have the link which connects our amplifiers to that log periodic structure. And on that picture, that's um, a fairly recent one, you can see that link breaks sometime. And that also gives you that periodic structure in the system temperature. So that was the point which, if we get that one more reliable, the feed works perfectly and we can roll it out. Um, so to do that, we looked at basically what causes those um, link designs to break. So one of the things which we found is kind of the vibration at the front end. So we have, that's the feed open as well. So we have a cryo cooler, which cools down our feed, the entire feed, which you see here to around um, 80 Kelvin. And that one has some vibration. And in the past, um, it was not, the dampener was not very well tuned. So we went through to identify that we could reduce significantly the reduction uh, the vibration or reduce that. And um, we also figured out with simulating the entire perform uh, entire feed that thermal expansion can break that tip link. So we set up a new model, um, kind of an FEM model, and also done mechanical stress analysis on those link tips to see kind of how do we need to redesign that part that it will be more robust and that it will allow for thermal expansion, what we see um, are happening. So that was kind of a joint effort with Space Science Lab, um, with Berkeley and SETI. And that is now the new prototype, which um, the picture here, that one is one which I got today. So we redesigned the tip with a longer way, made sure that the electromagnetic properties are similar, that we don't lose um, performance and also allow more flexibility. So those are kind of the link tips and those are the ones which are kind of hold in place to see how that fit. Bear in mind that from this side to the other side, it's about four millimeter or less than four millimeter, the entire tip. So it is really tiny and it's really difficult to solder on. But ideally, hopefully at the end of this week, I have a new feed prototype which I can take up to the ATA next week and then test it um, and see how robust it is and see if we can deploy um, the rest of it. Um, so uh, good time wise. So as with all of the presentations, you want to have a bit of a sales pitch um, from the ATA. So you see there's a lot of going on um, at the ATA at the moment and the ATA itself, um, the way it's built, it's kind of a very unique instrument. It allows you to be used as a test bench for new backend for SETI development because we have all of the RF signals in the signal processing room. We're very flexible with plugging in new digital hardware. Um, we have a very wide um, frequency coverage with that instrument. So there are a lot of opportunities to kind of develop the next generation of SETI searches. And also um, something which recently happened, we have um, basically um, an MOU and I think new radio joined with SETI. So there's also um, a huge opportunity for professional training in radio engineering um, at the ATA. So we had this year, um, I was sadly not there, 
but we had a um, um, hackathon where a lot of people came and done some software development in the environment of the ATA and that turned out to be very successful and we want to do that as well. Um, so the final point, I just uh, want to say that this is not the only kind of instrument which SETI is working on. So there's some um, effort going into the JVLA or the Chensky VLA to do commensal SETI as well. So initially in 2013, 2014, um, people looked first time into that um, into that to see if it's feasible to do. But at that time, it looked like it's very expensive to have SETI on. Uh, the VLA. So in 2018, there was kind of a renewed interest when um, costs, um, when, when it was indicated that costs reduce, and that was then taken up with a site visit in 2018 and 2019, and some implementation plan to actually do SETI on the VLA. And that program also has been funded now. So there are people kind of um, as well joined from the SETI Institute for Berkeley. Um, Breakthrough Listen and uh, Berkeley University working on that one. So I guess you saw that slide earlier in Vishal's talk. That's kind of um, shows very uh, in a very nice way um, what we're going to do. So when the VLA is observing a primary target within the main uh, within the uh, beam forming on target within the primary beam, we can do um, commensal kind of beam forming and look at targets close by which allows us to do a 24-7 operation and um, an independent control of which targets we select within the primary beam. The way it's implemented, it's kind of with, with uh, um, Ethernet speakers. So the VLA is constructed that all of those signals from the antenna get into a baseline board. And luckily, there's one output of those baseline boards which is not used. And that output allows us to get access to the low level um, data products of the VLA, where we then can build um, a hardware which allows us to capture those data and send that over Ethernet and use an Ethernet based kind of correlator and, and similar hardware to what we use um, in Neocat to do the um, signal processing. Um, so the final kind of, I think it's the final slide, just um, one of the pictures I took from the paper from Jack Hickish. Um, it's a graph which, tell, which shows you um, basically the, transmit, the transmitter rate and kind of the power on the x-axis. So to detect signals. So for weak signals, it goes to the left side, and the transmitter rate is basically tells you how often a certain event happens. So for an instrument to be good to kind of um, detect signals, you want to have it in the left lower corner. So with the VLA, we definitely kind of improve the transmitter rate because we have a lot of um, observing time on that one. Um, and also kind of the sensitivity with that size is very good compared um, to other instruments. Um, ah, okay, so I got one more slide and then you're all um, basically free. Um, so the last slide is kind of just um, to mention with the NGVLA. So the NGVLA or the next um, generation VLA, um, the SETI Institute is also a partner in that one. And so we want to make sure that even in the planning um, phase, we make sure that technical signature searches uh, or requirements for those are included into the system design from the beginning. So the NGVLA is basically the, um, the answer of the SKA from the US answer of the SKA, you could say that. So you will have um, yeah, a receiver like collecting areas, but a much wider frequency coverage. Um, and that will, I guess, change um, the way um, set or all the SETI instruments which we have at the moment, if we can have the NGBLA and do SETI on that one. And with that one, um, thank you very much. All right. Thank you to both of our speakers. Are there any questions for Alex? Go ahead and unmute your mic. Um, yeah, I have, yeah, I have, I have. I'm Lyle, tuning in from, from Melbourne. Um, yeah, um, thanks, thanks, Alex, for the talk. Um, I probably missed it, but um, how many dishes um, are 
suitable right now um, for observations. Um, so the entire array has 42 antennas, and at the moment, currently, fully operational are 10, 10 feet. Um, but as soon as kind of that design works, so we could basically put more fields into the uh, more feeds into the field. But I I want to wait to have a design which is truly reliable um, because if we would roll out that version of feed now on all of those antennas, we would have immense kind of main uh, maintenance costs. And to avoid that, I rather um, wait a bit longer to see that the feed design is very robust and then roll out more feeds at the beginning of next year. Okay, and the, the long-term goal is to keep on, um, well, um, stay on the, on, the, um, on the current design um, feeds, right? Like an improved um, design of the feeds and not change it drastically. Yes. So if, oh, okay, so if that feed is, um, so if we can have it reliable, and if it, if it works, then there's no point on changing um, drastically anything in the design. But if the effort which we put in now should turn out that that feed design, you can't get it um, reliable with um, extra amount of efforts, then we need to kind of um, basically sit together and work out, do we want to change the design or um, do we want to put in those extra amount of effort so that also depends on um, the funding which we have, because at the moment that peat design is funded. And um, so depending on what it is, so we, are, we don't, we don't want to kind of stack ourselves with one solution and try to make it work. We want to kind of assess if, if that is useful, does that make sense? Um, and if not, what are the alternatives? And basically have a list with trade-offs. But the plan is to have all 42 antennas um, populated within the next two years. Okay. Hey, Alex, this is Elliot. Will the new digital backend still be managed by the Sonata real-time target analysis system? Um, no, I don't think so. I think um, we go to um, basically hardware which breakthrough uh, listen users to try to kind of um, basically have between the groups have a common software um, analysis and common hardware which makes it easier to get support um, from breakthrough listen because one of the things which we like at the ATA is um, people as resources so currently um, I'm the only one on site working from SETI on it we will have two more people starting um, one in a couple of weeks who looks at the software side and another one who's starting doing the observations um, in January. But to keep things simple, um, we want to use basically as much hardware from Breakthrough Listen, which also allows us then to use people which are present here, which have software skills to ask for help and get support from that side. Any last questions for either speaker? in-house questions. <laughs> All right. Um, so if there's no further questions. Sorry, Sorry oh. Julia, can you, can you hear okay, me? Yes. Yeah. I, I have a question for, this is Andrew. I have a question for, uh, for Dr. Gajar. Um, of all of the international facilities that you're working on bringing into the LISTEN program, which one is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard question, Andrew. It's like choosing a best kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, technically, if I say uh, the more sensitive one, which I think would be uh, quite useful, would be FAST, I guess. And FAST is the most sensitive one, and I think PROMIS is provides more opportunity. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm also excited about LOPAR because uh, the low frequency is very much unexplored. Awesome. All right, um, so we're gonna conclude in just a moment. We have some outro slides and music. And um, if anyone saw the slide, I'm gonna actually start sharing my screen in just a second. Um, we're gonna have a, another meeting on December 17th at 10 a.m. Pacific time um, with 
Sophia Sheik, or Sophia Sheik, if I'm saying it right. Um, and she's going to be talking about maximum drift rates. Um, and a bonus, if anyone can guess where the image of uh, the graphic from this month's talk, where that telescope is, the one that our speakers are standing in front of, you get a bonus point. So that's your challenge for next week. And with that, I'll say thank you for joining. I'm sorry, Julia, um, this, is, this is Andrew again. Is there a prize? Perhaps. Yes. A prize. What, what is the prize? It's to be announced. I don't think you're allowed to participate. <laughs> and Alex is, is not allowed to participate. Oh. Um, great. So let me see if I can. I'll put it up one more time. Should we see the best See if this works. Do we need to mute that one here again? There it is. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is your challenge. And with that, uh, we'll say thanks for joining and see you next month. The challenge is what that was. Thanks. Bye. I'll leave. Yeah.